this song. Uh, it's got a bit of a backstory to it, and um, I hope you don't think I'm uh, dropping names, but uh, I swear to God, everything I'm about to say is true. So, I was, uh, let's see now, how do we go about this? Uh, righty. Uh, I've got a friend who's a drummer. He actually played on the first song that I ever got recorded uh, years and years ago, uh, before uh, uh, the uh, drum machines and bass lines were all hooked up and all that. Uh, for recording sessions, he used to hire a drummer and a bass player who would work together. So uh, I was working with Jim Ruff. Jim Rafferty, uh, produced by Jerry Rafferty, Jim's first album, a song that Jim and I had written, and um, a guy called Pick Withers come along, uh, along with another chap uh, from Newcastle called Rod Clements. Rod, the uh, bass player, and Pick on the drums, Rod, the guy who wrote Meet Me on the Corner, uh, a wonderful lad, one of the main, the main and founders of uh, Lindisfarne. And years passed, and uh, I ended up actually staying in a flat uh, that belonged to the guitarist of Lindisfarne. He's called Sai Kou. It was my friend Rob Noakes uh, had uh, got me, had in touch with me, he said there was a room going. I was squatting down in South London at this time, and um, he got me the, the room in Simon Kou's uh, flat. And uh, I went up to see Simon, just to have the crack, and... Um, find out what the uh, rent was and the story and all and uh, Pick Withers come in uh, well, Simon says to me do you know Pick? I says aye I, I says I do aye How, how's it going? and he looked at me and goes I know you don't I, I says aye here's going on this session at Decca with Jerry and Jim and all and I says oh right 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 and I says how are you doing? he says no oh, not bad just been rehearsing with these guys and all I said, it's been great to see you, man, and that. And, uh, so that was it. We just had to cry with Simon. OK, there's a room. You're most welcome. When you moved in, sort, sorted all that out. And uh, again, uh, Pick and his band, they did their first album. Uh, initially, there wasn't all that much happening. Um, and their manager had said to them, uh, take a month off, because... The wheels are beginning to move and you're going to be very busy. Now, the name of the band was Dire Straits and it was the Sultan's Sink swing album that they just completed. And uh, Simon, um, uh, I beg your pardon, um, uh, Pick, uh, went down to the Y Valley, down Wales. Well, it's kind of in between Wales and England and uh, for a wee break. And he said to me, if you want to come down for a few days, you're more than welcome. Uh, he'd lived down there uh, and he was a session drummer for... Uh, um, Rockfield Studios, just outside Monmouth. So I took him up on his offer, went down. Beautiful place, beautiful place. Uh, I'd been a wee bit strung out with an assortment of things, a romance and a band that didn't work out, or whatever. All part of life. And um, I was introduced, uh, Pick introduced me to a guy, Mark Phillips, uh, who great guitarist and uh, all around cool guy and he was actually building a little studio down there and uh, he asked me how long I was uh, going to be hanging about I'd had a play with him and that he was just he said he was enjoying my songs and of course at this point in time Jerry was actually going through the roof with uh, the Baker Street story and all and uh, Mark had said well how you fix for money he says if you want to come in and do a bit of toshing in the studio. Uh, and I'd already seen his wee studio and said, it's a really great setup. So I said, ah, why not, you know? Painted some walls and that, he made me with some shillings and all. And he says, how are things in London? And I says, well, ah, I've been better, man, you know. He says, um, well, there's a wee cottage next to the studio, you could stay there if you wanted, you know. I says, I could stay there. <laughs> he says, yeah, come down and manage the studio and you could stay there. I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. So I went down. Uh, it was Marianne Noakes, uh, Rab's wife, uh, his first wife. Uh, she actually gave us a run down, which saved my life, really. You know, it was got me together. So, And, of course, Dire Straits. They, they too, went through the roof with success and all. You know. And uh, we all went to the uh, see them in uh, Bristol. That was the nearest big city. 
Uh, well, apart from Hereford, but anyway, it was Bristol we seen them. And anyway, so that was that. Then the next bit of news that starts coming along is that um, Mark and uh, Pick had been invited by Bob Dylan to go to LA to work on Dylan's new album. Dylan himself had been going through a kind of funny period where he had uh, gone back to his Jewish roots. There were photographs of him with his wee skull cap on at the Wailing Wall and all. And then he dropped that and became a Christian. His writing wasn't that great around that time as well. Um, and people were going, maybe he's cracked up all together, you know. But uh, he hadn't cracked up that much if he'd thought, right, I'll get Mark and uh, Pike, because he'd seen Dire Straits, so they thought, right, I'll get the two guys and then get another couple of his mates to play along. Uh, so that was going on as well, and um, we were all chuffed for Pike, you know, that he'd, he was way out there. We were working away one afternoon in the studio, and uh, the phone goes. Uh, the guy went to talk to you here, Frank. Okay, hi, how you doing? Pike. Pike. Uh, how you doing? You still in LA? What's happened? He says, no, I'm just driving down. I've just stopped off at a transport cafe. Are you doing anything? This is well, we're a wee bit busy, but, is, but you're coming down? He says, yeah, I was going to come round. He says, I've got some rough mixes of the new Bob Dylan album. And I said, well, you've got the... the well, I... <laughs> So we sent out for a carry out and uh, Pick and Julie arrived and we uh, he stuck it on and we were all getting steamed up, etc. And um, it was pretty amazing. Now Jerry at this time, he, uh, as I say, he'd Baker Street had been done, a massive success. He'd got himself a new music, a new manager uh, by the name of Michael Gray. Now Michael... Uh, is also a writer, uh, and he wrote a uh, song and dance man. He's a Dylanologist, you know. And Jerry had got in touch with me, and he was saying that there was a wee, uh, he'd been invited over to uh, Pilton, I think it is, quite very close to Glastonbury. And uh, he asked me if I'd like to play. I said, of course, of course, you know. And he was saying, well, told me who was going to be in the band and I thought, oh, definitely, definitely. And he, he, I says, so when do you want me over? He says, I'll tell you, Frank, because um, the studio had relocated to a, a an older uh, location and uh, there was a house that was built, the first part of it was built in 1566. It really was one of those old uh, ones with the, the black oak beams and all that stuff. He says, you've been telling me about it. He says, I'm dying to see it. How about if me and Michael come down and get you, then we'll drive back over to Somerset. I says, well, I'd be delighted. To. I says, that would suit me, of course it would. I. So they come down, and uh, it was just amazing to see them, uh, you know, the pair of them. And uh, Michael, a very laconic kind of way of speaking and all. And he says, have you had anyone particularly famous in Frank? I says, you mean apart from yourself, Michael, and you and Gerald? Uh, he goes, oh, no. You. I says, well, actually, aye. I says, Pick Withers uh, was here last week. I, says, I thought he was in Los Angeles with Bob Dylan. I says, well, he, he was up until last week. He, and uh, I says, aye, let us hear the rough mixes in the new Dylan album, at which Michael nearly fell over. And said, so, you've heard rough mixes in the new Dylan album? I says, aye. I says, what was it like? Says, uh, it was a wee bit like Dire Straits, to be honest. <laughs> well, it would be with Mark playing the guitar all over <laughs> But anyway, uh, he's going, oh, right, right, Frank, right, right. As you know, his writing had taken a dip. Um, there must be some lines. And I'm going, yeah, some lines or something. says, hmm. Then I realised that we'd had actually got more than a little mashed. We'd got mashed. And I'm going, oh, God, I I said, I remember at the time thinking, this is really... Oh, I said, oh, I do remember one, I do remember one. I've never seen a fire could put out water. And Michael's going, he's got it, he's, he's back, Dylan's back, this is fantastic, I can't wait to hear the album. I said, me and the ears, you know. So, a few weeks passed, and, uh, well, it's almost a month or so, and uh, Michael phones up. <laughs> Hello, Michael, how's it going? Bogey, you bastard. I says, what have I done now? He says, um, I've listened to that album three times. 
I'm even considering listening to it backwards. I cannot hear, I have never seen a fire could put out water. He says, you know, oh well, maybe they never... He says, but you don't understand, Frank. I come back to London, I've been telling everybody. And the example I was giving them about how great this album's going to be is this line, I've never seen a fire could put out water. I said, oh, you can't blame me for that, man. Come on, he's a fucking break. <laughs> I says... Oh, you still waited till you heard it yourself. He says, well, it's too late now, isn't it? I says, well, I you know. I says, but I'm not taking the blame for it. I say, you know, so <laughs> I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a song for Michael and I'm going to call it Never Seen a Fire Could Put Out Water. <laughs> That's really good. That's, this is how this song comes around.